And as she, there she is. Hello. Welcome. welcome. <clears throat> awesome, guys. So as a reminder for everybody who is just joining us now, perhaps they um, didn't catch the first part of this before every speaker, I will just remind you guys what the Digital Marketing League is, why we put it on. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a webinar series where we try and provide some value when it comes to digital marketing, content marketing, SEO, technical SEO, um, just, you know, some free content for you guys to use in your content strategy or digital marketing strategy that hopefully is beneficial. Um, and we bring together all the speakers, um, you know, it could be today we have four, we've had six in the past. So we, we just try and get a team of speakers and they compete to be our digital marketing league champion. So there are no losers in the Digital Marketing League, but there is a winner. You guys determine that winter, winner by going and taking those polls like we did just with Philip. You rate them, and then the person with the highest rating is the winner. And then in the future Digital Marketing League event, they come back to defend their title against new competitors. So as you guys saw, he just gave our first presentation. Philip Thune, the CEO of Text Ripper, is the commissioner. He will hop on um, a little bit later once Christine's done with her presentation to do some Q&A. Again, just a reminder of our partners. Uh, we appreciate them for their time, their effort. And with that, Christine, um, she is our next speaker. And she started her career in 1998 as a front-end web developer. Uh, website designer. She became one of the foremost experts on Google and SEO. She's consulted for a very large range of clients from small businesses to huge companies. Uh, she's a speaker at industry conferences around the world and has written for leading SEO publications. Perhaps you've heard of them like Search Engine Land, Search Engine Watch, and uh, one of my favorites is Search Engine Journal. So with that, Christine, I will go ahead and disappear into the background and stop sharing my screen so you can. Okay. And if you need me, I will be here. And then just a quick reminder, I almost forgot. Um, if you have any questions for her, please put them in the chat. We will have a Q&A session um, probably starting around 840, 845, where you can ask Christine any question, um, maybe about her presentation, about SEO, and we'll go from there. So once again, thank you, Christine, and I will turn thank it you. over to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, just before I start, um, if you notice a cat behind me, there's nothing I can do about it. I just want to warn you ahead of time. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and get started. We had some problems with this yesterday, so hopefully it will work fine today. Cody, can you pop on just real quick and let me know if you can see that okay? Yeah, that was good. Um, if there's a little white bar that says event.demio, if you just want to hit hide. There you go. <clears throat> yeah, but you, you, can, you can see the full screen, great. Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, thanks. Also, uh, I can't see the next slide coming, so if I jump ahead of myself a little bit, just forgive me, I will I catch up, so. Okay, so we're going to talk today about uh, Google search uh, and Google in language. Um, Google has moved to some as to what we call natural language understanding over the years, uh, but uh, they're trying to move to something called natural language processing, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the AI layers in search. Um, some of this may get a little bit heady but I'm gonna give you some really simple and easy ways to apply all this at the very end. Christine, real quick, for some reason, your system preferences box came up if you wanna exit out of that. Sorry about that, I was trying to, <laughs> sorry. There you go, no, I, I just wanted to make sure you saw it. I was trying to exit out of, there was, the notifications should be off, but they came, they were on. So. No, you're good. Yeah, so sorry about that, guys. Okay, so in the beginning, there is this thing, uh, this large scale hypertextual web search engine started by these two guys. Uh, if you don't know who they are, they are the billionaires who run Google or did run Google. And now they're just part of Alphabet. Uh, so Sergey Brin and Lawrence Page, this was their paper on, um, on this idea of Google and how they were going to change search. Um, the original Google was only 108 gigabytes. So you can fit that on your USB. If you think about what Google is today, think how small it started. Literally could fit on your USB right now. 
Today, though, over um, half the world's population searches every day on the internet. So that's over 4.6 billion people as of last month. It jumped a lot during the pandemic. It was like 3 billion last year. So a lot of people wound up going online that weren't online before. And Google processes uh, trillions of queries every year. So every time you type something into search, we just call that a query if you if you're not familiar with some of these terms. And uh, so every time you type one in, Google has to process it, pull back a relevant search result, and um, they do that with billions of websites. So they crawl billions of websites so that they can match trillions of queries every year. So today there are already this many Google searches. And Google processes about 78,000, 80,000, 100,000 searches a second. So this is what we call big data. And so when Google started, it was, you know, the small thing of 108 gigabytes. And now it processes trillions of queries a year. And that proposed uh, posed some issues for Google in how they were going to scale uh, their ability to bring you back information in seconds that's relevant to what you're searching. So they had to deal with that data. So Google search was originally found on something called unstructured data. And unstructured data just meant that the data has no definition to Google. It's just it's just text. And they used indicators like how many times that text was on a page to determine that page might be about that text, but it didn't understand anything about the text that it was looking at. So this is called the bag of words approach. And the bag of words approach is basically, we just have this bag of words and we try to derive meaning from outside indicators. So if you've been in uh, content a long time or content writing a long time, you know these as keywords. So originally Google was keywords. Now you'll hear me use the word query a lot today because keywords make up a query, but nowadays we use query because query represents uh, a more semantic idea of looking at what's in the page. So unstructured data uses keywords. If you've been in search or writing content for any period of time, you know like you had to put the keyword in the title and you had to put it in the URL and you had to put it in the body text and in the image and you had to put it multiple times on the page and some people put it like 100 times on the page hoping to rank better and that did work in the early days, doesn't work anymore. Um, so this is how unstructured data works. You put the keyword in, uh, Google would see that you know this page is about auto repair because it's in every important spot on the page. Um, and that is not how they do it anymore, but that is how they did it up until just a few years ago. So as a queries number, if we get trillions of unstructured data just becomes inefficient. Google doesn't have the ability to pull back the information it needs as quickly as it needs to pull it back uh, rel with relevancy um, when they're using unstructured data. So they decided to move into se semantic search. So we're moving keywords to queries. Keywords are always part of queries, but queries are where we add, actually add context, where we use sentences. And Google actually understands the sentences, not just a word or two in the sentence. Um, so we went from lexical search to search with meaning. That's all semantic means. We use a lot of specialized terms today, but I try to give you the basic um, layman's uh, definition of it as well. So now we're moving into semantic search. So semantic search just means search with meaning. It just means that now that you, when you write a story about a dog, Google knows a dog is a dog, and it knows that dogs have collars and dogs have take walks and you know dogs eat food, certain types of food. So there's meaning to your query. It's not just a bag of words that they're looking at. So with semantic search, they're trying to understand the intent, and that intent is your intent as a searcher. So when you go to Google and you try to find something, they're trying to match your intent be, without you telling them anything more than putting a few words in there. So why is it so important? So the holy grail of search is NLP. In fact, Bing had a NLP um, unit on uh, the Microsoft campus that was uh, no one could get into without biometric, um, passing biometrics like I, you know, things like that. Uh, and that was uh, 15 years ago or, or more. And they still haven't cracked NLP. So NLP is natural language processing, which means as I speak right now, you hear the words, but you're not sitting in your head unless English isn't maybe your first language, um, translating those words. Your brain just goes, hey, I know what those words mean and I'm understanding what you're saying. So that's the idea of NLP. Eventually the search engines want to get to where they literally understand what you're saying, as opposed to having to try to decipher what you're saying. Um, so they started this with the knowledge graph in 2012. Um, if you hear knowledge graph, Google isn't the only knowledge graph. They've been around since the 70s. And all it means is opposed to 
putting text in a data, like just in a database, uh, they actually create a graph relationship between words. So like uh, banana and apple are fruits, and so they might be close to each other in the graph, where like banana and motor oil would not be because there's not really a relationship between the two. So this is what the one of the early ones looked like if you tried to graph out a section of it. And so you can see that there is um, these words here, these are like entities, and then nodes or the lines between that show the relationships. So the knowledge here from Google is basically a definitional set of words, um, and Google started it with things like landmarks and celebrities and sports teams and buildings and all these things, and so you can instantly get information that's relevant to the query because they know what it is. In other words, these are just nouns. So when you hear entity search, basically it's noun search. Um, Google's not uh, defining like adjectives or things like that, right? So it knows that the Las Vegas Strip is a Las Vegas Strip because it's a noun and they have a definition that they picked up from data sources that they originally used to uh, prime the knowledge graph. So nouns equal entities. So Google's moving to this entity search, this understanding of language search by providing definitions for nouns in its database so it knows what they, what they mean. And here's some of the entities found in the knowledge graph. So um, these are like, you know, very basic things. I'm sure you've looked up on Google, like, you know, what's a, my TV series? What is it on? Uh, what's that video game coming out? What's that book? Where's that local business? Where I want to go see a movie? So these are very basic. Um, entities found in the knowledge graph, but they're the origin of it, and actually still primarily most of what's in the knowledge graph. So entities, nouns, and the relationships, nodes, equals the knowledge graph. So I have the apple and the banana in the knowledge graph. It knows that these are fruits, and that they're close together. Their line would be short. That's the node, the relationship. And then there's a, a mathematical formula for the strength of that relationship. So why are they uh, why are we doing this? Because we have an answer engine. So Google's goal is to be an answer engine. So you just you put something in and they just bring you back the right answer every time. That's what they're trying to get to. Uh, they even have something uh, called the MUM uh, language model right now that just came out. And that supposedly is going to be able to give you solitary single answers to what you query on. Don't worry, though, if you do the web for a living or search for a living, it's not going to be done in the main search results. They have to sell ads because they have to make money. So Google becomes an answer engine uh, 2021. This is what they look at. So for the answer engine, they also call these micro moments. So Google can pull back a data point. So it can be like directions and traffic or um, a feature snippet is the top of the search where you type something in and you get the answer on top and often you don't feel the need to click because you already got what you needed. So this started back with hummingbird strings to things. So again, we we're talking about that bag of words approach, which was like strings just a bunch of words and text to things, known entities and nouns. So they did this, started this around 2013. And so this was the big step. Uh, Hummingbird was a complete restructuring of how Google interpreted language and search and, and all of those things. <clears throat> Again, things are known objects with learned relationships or known. So as you type things in, Google may over time learn that there's a relationship. Um, they might not know it right off the bat, but they put it back into their machine learning uh, back at Google, and then they spit out new relationships for, for known words. So it's just instead of text without meaning, the knowledge graph is relation, re, relational. I mentioned a little bit of this before, but it's just objects and mapped relationships. So Google knows this is ice. Google knows this is and T. And if I put the two together, Google knows it's ice T. So if I put in a search for um, like summer drink or black, uh, black sweet tea, Google knows that these things are related and they're often also related to ice. Um, or like ice is related to cold drinks. So this is that object mapping I was talking about where they take the known object ice and cold and drinks and they know it all goes together to form ice cold drinks when you take a, when you put it in, in the search engine. This is what it looks like mathematically. Don't get bogged down on this. This isn't something like you, anyone really needs to know outside search, but it is just good to kind of see how they do it. So what happens is they put the, the words into the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph has defined meanings, and then inside that knowledge graph, they decide how close they are 
apart, those words are um, in relation to each other, um, and they give, do that all with a mathematical formula, and these are the mathematical uh, associations. So basically, knowledge graph is just to help bat, uh, better match user intent. So if I want iced tea, it knows iced tea. So it doesn't have to do any real processing anymore. It can just pull that back as a result. So this is their first step towards natural language understanding. If you listen to anything with Google, they don't actually say they do NLP. They say they do NLU. I'll explain that in a minute. So natural language understanding means you still have to use machines to help you interpret what your um, what someone's searching. So if it's, again, if it's natural language processing, Google would understand me like you understand me right now talking. And you wouldn't have to sit here and get a dictionary and look up the words and find out what the meaning and how close they were to each other. But because it's natural language understanding, uh, they, they still have to do that. So natural language understanding is just what computers do. And natural language processing is the goal, the final outcome, the idea that they're going to be able to just understand language as you write it, type it, in every dialect, in every slang word, in every language in the world, which is quite a tremendous process if you think about it. So <clears throat> NLU is not a subset of natural language processing. It's a, an overlap. It's in the same area, though. So when you look at this here, you'll see uh, if you, if any of you are into like, you know, uh, language in detail, you'll know like there's sentiment analysis, although Google doesn't do that. Uh, but question and answering, parsing of the meanings and the relationships in the sentences. And then as you get in here into the NLP, which they have some of now, um, like machine translation, uh, they get more and more into the idea that they can automatically understand what we type or what we say, which is really the important part for them. Because as we move into voice devices or more and more into voice devices, they want you to be able, they want to be able to understand what you're saying um, and quickly. So we go from this vector only to these category relationships and the embedded word model, which we talked about a little bit. Again, this is very heady stuff. If you're like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming, don't worry. When we get down to the end, there's going to be some very simple things you can apply, but I want you to fully understand how Google approaches language because it is very complex nowadays. It's not like it used to be where you just stuff some keywords in a page. Um, so they embed wor words into the vector space that like we talked about before. And this is kind of what it looks like in the vector space. So, you know, walked and walking are uh, forms of the same word, walk, uh, swimming, swam. So they even know like verb tense. So it's not just about like ice and tea and objects that are close to each other, but also that they understand relationships based on, in this case, gender, verb tense, or country and capital. So all of that just boils down to words go in, they get assigned a mathematical address in a vector, similar related words sit close to each other in that space, and then words are retrieved based on your query that best fit the vector, and the interpretations are used to return results. Um, so I'm humming about, ah, I can't speak this morning, sorry guys, it's early for me, and I already had two meetings. <laughs> Hummingbird added a semantic layer to the search algorithms. So it's not just keywords anymore. It's really important that people who write content or do content understand it's not just about keywords now. It's also about semantic interpretations. So Hummingbird added like a semantic layer. Like before it was strict keywords, like you've had to put dog photos in so many times on a page. But that changed to variants. So it could be, as this example, dog photos or photos of Fido or puppy pictures, dog photography, canine shots. Google knows all of those are related. So you can, don't have to use the word five times or 10 times on a page anymore. In fact, that's really discouraged. Um, you can use variants of the term to try to get a broader or more in-depth understanding of your content. And then semantic distance and term relationships. So if a term is close to a term or is close to it programmatically, then it might be related. So if I put apple and orange in a paragraph, then Google knows I'm, those are related in that context of that uh, sentence on that page. Um, also titles and headers, if it's up there or if it's in a bullet list. So like if you do uh, want to get in the featured snippet, uh, you have to use certain types of code for Google to actually pull you up. And one of them is a bullet list. And the bullet list tells Google that all these items are related. They're equally distant from each other. And so they can help interpret what's in the page that way. Now, if we put something in the first paragraph and the fourth paragraph, then it's probably not considered as associated. And so you may not, um, you, know, you may not be pulled up for that item. 
And then there's also phrase-based index and in incoherence, which is just a big way of saying that uh, that there are phrases that can concur with each other and, and uh, co-occur with each other. And then Google knows, sorry, a little dry mouth. Um, Google knows that those are related, like U.S. presidents and the White House and George Washington, um, versus the other one where it's like New York, Broadway, U.S. presidents are not, not really that related. So if you want to get a better ranking for something, you want to use co-occurring um, entities in the same page, uh, especially with, like the wider or deeper ability to show and search. And then also where in the page you're putting things. So are you putting them in the main body text? Well, that's a, more important than the sidebar way more important than the header or the footer. Really important in the header, you have your navigation, but in the footer, Google actually discounts almost every link out of the footer because um, people used it to stuff keywords. So uh, mostly if you want your content to um, count mostly for or highest for rankings, you wanna make sure it's in the main body text. And by the way, Google actually does lay out the page. So they actually do know where in the page these things exist because they crawl your page on one level, but they also render your page on another. And then there's entity salience they added um, in 2018, 2019. So that's a, that's a topic layer. So sometimes so people will go, why is this page ranking for these keywords? I don't see these keywords anywhere on the page and I don't see any links related to it. And that can be because Google has this entity layer where they know if you mention Iron Man and Tony Stark and Pepper Potts, that this is like probably Iron Man or Marvel Comics. And they don't need you to say Marvel Comics to pull the page back from Marvel Comics. So we had Hummingbird that went from the strict word count, I mean, moves from strict word count to probabilistic, probabilistic that's a really hard word this time of the morning, modeling. Um, so basically they're trying to predict what you're searching for. They're trying to uh, predict what you would ask that go with the term that you're looking at by using these relationships and these modeling and entity salience and all that. And again, they're, you know, it's, uh, they still don't process natural language in the, the, the true sense, so we have to add an interpreter. And I don't know if, how many people here are working with schema or have used schema, but if you have a website, you wanna make sure it has schema on it. And if you don't know how to do schema, there are plugins for it if you use WordPress. Um, and there's all sorts of course, SEOs that can help you with it. Um, but schema is a way to tell Google what your page is about. Now, it's not a ranking signal. You don't rank higher for schema but you do make it easier for Google to understand what your site or your page is about. So in the, in the example here, we talk about recipes. So you, when you use schema in the code, you tell Google, this part is the recipe summary. This is the ingredients list. This is uh, the cooking section. And so Google doesn't have to try to interpret it as much because it knows you've already told it this is a recipe and then the code you're telling it everything else that is involved with the recipe. So um, this is structured data. Schema is part of structured data. And schema is that on-page markup I just told you about. It helps Google better understand what your page is about. And why does it matter? Because instead of you giving Google just like this text and HTML code, you're actually giving it directions about your page. You're telling it what your page is about. Is it an article? Is it an FAQ? Is it a question and answer? Um, is it a book? Is it a movie? Things like that. So it helps, is it a review? So you're telling Google what it is, so you don't have to have Google guess what it is. So you're, you have a much better chance of it coming up for what you want it to come up for. So we basically tell Google what our site's about and the relationships in our site. So we act as an interpreter. We can help teach Google the context of our content. And remember, this is about that natural language understanding. Google doesn't understand language like you and I right now, you listening to me. So they need that machine to help it understand it better. And this is part of that process. And we can help teach Google uh, the context of our content. So we stand out from the crowd. So basically it just all boils down to, we give Google this clear understanding of what our content's about. And so when users ask a question like, what is the recipe um, time to cook X, Y, Z? Google knows there are pages that already told it. Here's that cooking time. I'm going to pull this back. So schema makes everybody happy. It's really awesome. And if you don't have it really, you want to make sure you have it on your site. So now we have the AI portion. Um, so Google has uh, an AI called Rain Green. 
It's one of two algorithms that uses AI and the live results. So <clears throat> Google doesn't have AI and the regular results. It, it, the, it doesn't do ranking factors by AI. Um, so when you have a page and uh, you get all the signals, right, like you put the title in and the description and you have the content on the page, um, Google's, you know, not doing that by AI. They're doing that by algorithms and processes, but they're not doing it because if they did it by AI and AI broke, then they wouldn't be able to fix it because they wouldn't know what the AI did. And so they can't risk that with the 85% of the revenue still coming from ads on a page. But they can add it to the results in different ways. So RankBrain deals with new queries. Um, it also is, it started out being like on 15% of all pages and like 30%. Now it's uh, brought in almost every time. But it's used for unknown queries where entity meetings and relationships, relationships are clear unknown. So like we talked about before, if the, let's say motor oil and banana are on a page um, and Google's like, I don't understand motor oil and banana being on a page, you might get a rank brain result because it doesn't have a definition or relationship between the two. So the presence of rank brain means Google's confused. And you can actually tell this by looking at the result if rank brain is being used and if it's being amped up. So I like to use this example. It's a little bit older, but because I was traveling to Europe, I had the ability to do it in two places. Um, so I looked up suites in Las Vegas, and suites in the United States doesn't have a definitive meaning. Um, it's just sweets, you know, it might be cake, it might be ice cream, it might be candy. But in the UK, sweets is actually candy. And so we do have UK residents here, so we do have people that search for it, and you can see this like um, starting a sweets business or sweets feet candy. But we also have like sweet sweat and uh, dessert food delivery and sweet shops near me. Um, and so Google's not clear on what sweet means, especially because sweet sweats in the product part three times. Um, this is a rank brain result. It means it's throwing a kitchen sink up there. It's gonna give you different things that it think you might mean. And then over time, as people select items, then Google will have a better definition of what sweets means. So, um, so before, like we talked about the words go in and they get a sign and the best fit, and the relationships are weak or unknown, enters rank brain, and that data is constantly fed into the machine learning process so as to make the results more relevant over time. So I actually discovered rank brain before Google announced it because I was looking up water rights in Nevada, and um, I couldn't, when I looked it up in uh, Mesquite, I got nothing about water rights. I got the Water Authority, and I got uh, Mesquite trees, uh, Mesquite charcoal, and Mesquite barbecue, and I couldn't figure out why I was getting all these random results. And so I followed that and some other queries like that for about a year. Um, and I wrote an article on the day that I wrote the article for it to go out, Google announced Rank Brain. And so um, Rank Brain really is just, it's just trying to figure out what the user wants because it doesn't have a clear definition. So this one I just showed you. Well, a year later, this is what it looks like. So now it's got a map, right? Now it's got, um, shops now there's still not great results here but it's getting better it has a better understanding like see results about you know candy and chocolate right so google and rank brain also uses uses queries and clicks but also geolocation now when i say it uses queries and clicks they're not using that to rank the page they're just using that as information on what this item could mean uh, what the definition is as an entity um, you know, not as uh, if I click this a bunch of times, it'll rank better. But they use geolocation as well. So this is London and sweets. And sweets in London is meaningful because sweets in London is candy. And so you see almost everything here is about candy. There's no irrelevant results. I even get a, a graph, a knowledge graph here. There's ones on the right are knowledge graphs um, for sweets and chocolate and nutrition. And people recommend these ones. And then I can refine by variety. So in London, where sweets is defined in the knowledge graph as an entity known as candy, Google knows to pull back only basically things related to candy. Whereas in Las Vegas, Nevada, it wasn't really sure because we're not, in the US, sweets is not uh, used to refer to candy only. So location gives a semantic relevancy because sweets have no definitive entity in the United States. So that entity graph, that knowledge graph of nouns where they have the definitions changes based on location, language, um, you know, and uh, whether it knows the relationships or not. 
So then we have the right brain. Right brain's like, hey, I'm gonna throw the kitchen sink, blah, blah, blah. And now we have neural matching. That's the other AI layer. Now neural matching is, is a way to sort results and without using links and to just use uh, topics and synonyms. So uh, Danny Sullivan is the representative from Google who announces things like this. It's horrible screenshots here. I don't know why they're so bad. But anyways, uh, he was trying to show people when this came out um, that Google understood how all different definitions for change. Change could mean adjust, convert, exchange, install, modify. And then how, uh, like, why does my TV look strange? Well, they did so far perfect, you can see it came back in the top two results. So it knows somehow, through all the stuff we've just been talking about, that strange and soap opera effect are commonly linked together when it comes to queries about why your TV looks weird. I hate the soap opera effect. <laughs> so what is the difference between these two? So Rain Brain helps better relate pages to concepts like sweets, like candy. There's a sweets entity and it relates the whole page to that concept. Neural matching helps Google better relate the words to those searches by giving a broader definitional level. So it understood how change works in about 10 or 11 different um, meanings or different interpretations. Now these are both used and we call post retrieval ad hoc and dynamic relevancy, which is a really complicated way to say, when Google first takes in your site, it crawls your site, it scores your site, it scores your pages, and it puts it there and it's ranked, right? It has a rank value for them. Um, and then it used to be, that's all that happened when you created the top 10 or top 20 or top 100 for where they went in order. Well, now neural matching um, allows Google to use a second layer, which is only based on content, user intent, and uh, intent matching with no link no ranking factors. There's no way you and I can affect that layer other than to write really good content to the uh, way users are looking for us online. Um, so that's the neural matching layer. So it's added after the ranking and it determines the final sort order in the top. Um, well, I'm not, I'm going to say top 10, all the sort order, but most people only use top 10. Should you optimize for rank brain and neural matching? No. <laughs> So these are ever changing, right? Remember I've told you, they go back in and they reapply it and they change and you can see how much the US changed in a year on the suites, right? So you're not gonna waste your time, but you do need to understand that it happens so you know how important it is to write your content appropriately, to do your query research, to do your keyword research, to do uh, check how people are, are reaching your site, um, like go to Google Search Console and see what keywords they're using because you need to be really good at matching the intent of the user based on the things I've showed you here, and then also making sure the placements in the page are correct and expanding some of the, the query level to like add associated nouns or entities. So applying this to your SEO is like really heady stuff and it's really not that hard. You're just gonna write really good content and holistic content. So remember we we're talking about adding terms because Google has that ability to like give you more search results now because you don't have to put the same word 10 times, um, but you need related words. A really great way to see what they're semantically relating is to go and type something in image search. And when you get up these bubbles, it tells you the other things that it's associating it with. So sweets is candy and chocolate and food and Diwali and mix. And as you go to the right, it gets less and less relevant. So if you're trying to like write an article about sweets, you might come here and go, oh, I'm gonna add candy, chocolate, and food into my document because I know Google strongly associates that with sweets. You don't have to, but if you're trying to get a little more breadth of content. And use well-formed text. So everyone thinks like Google's like super smart and these bots are really good and they're really, you know, they're like a baby. Like Google's ability to understand language is really about a one-year-old and that's stretching it probably a little bit. So they really like your content to be well-formed. Um, and one of the things that um, they really like about well-formed, grammatically correct, like short sentences, that kind of thing, is um, it's easier to parse, right? If I have a sentence of like three commas and five conjunctions in it, one, I probably should write that better. But two, um, it means that Google can't easily determine context and meaning and semantics. So they like it when it's, you know, the 
text is well-formed and it's well-formed linguistically and grammatically. And they love it for questions. So you'll hear answer engine, right? Like Google came up with this idea, we're gonna be an answer engine. Yes, but also part of it is understanding language because questions are easy for the parsers and the language models to understand. If I'm talking right now and I just say, like this first line, understanding natural language queries is fundamental to many practical NLP systems, then you have to really be good at interpreting what is in the context of that sentence. But if I say, how is our language queries fundamental to practical NLP systems? Well, that has an answer that comes after it, right? So if I write in my content, and you can't always do this, but it's really good when you can, is to do a question and then an answer right below it, and then Google has a better time understanding that and then has an easier time pulling that information. So anytime you can do a question and anytime you can do schema with like Q&A or FAQs is a really good opportunity, not only to just do better in uh, being matched user intent, but also being pulled into some of those rich snippets that we talked about, um, like the featured snippet. Um, although you do have to have schema uh, to get, you don't have to get, to get pulled in, but you're much less likely to get pulled in uh, if you don't have schema. So remember that Google's an answer engine and that's how NLU and NLP works best. So try to answer questions. Um, even if you don't write the question into there, try to answer it. And these are the really simple things you need to, to apply. So you wanna think about intent of the users, the query terms that they, terms that they use and the context that those are found in and then the related um, contextual items. And of course, questions. So here's your, here's your takeaways. So I think search queries, not simple keywords. So most people are searching now by like, um, I like Chobani yogurt. So how do I find black cherry Chobani in Las Vegas is a question, right? Um, people used to just type in like black cherry Chobani Las Vegas. Now they're actually doing full sentences. So you have keywords in there, but Google also understands the, the, the little words in there. It understands the and and now when it didn't years ago. Um, it just skipped over them because they were irrelevant to Google, but they're not anymore. Um, write in natural conversational language. Um, this doesn't mean you have to write in any way that's like um, super complicated or super simple, whatever works for your content and your users. Just make it as natural as possible. Um, I often tell people who write content to know what terms they're writing to, but also to like write first and come back and add the terms in uh, because sometimes it's a lot easier than trying to write to a term and then I can seem a little unnatural. I write holistic, holistic content like I showed you with the Marvel comics or um, the candy that you add additional items in there, additional words. Now you don't want to put in a whole additional subjects. So if you're putting additional subjects, you want to make a new page. Google really likes clear uh, clarity and consistency and singularity when it comes to a content topic. But if you're in a content topic and you can throw in some other items that are related, then that's good to do. Um, that's also with depth and breadth of related terms. Add structured data and use well-formed text questions whenever you can. And if you do all that, you should be happy. And uh, you should do well in uh, Google search. It's really important to understand that you can't just stuff keywords in a page anymore and compete against people who are legitimately developing full content, full um, uh, explanations, full answers to questions. Uh, it, the keywords in the page just doesn't work as well anymore as the others do. It still works somewhat, but um, not as well as doing really well-formed uh, content that answers questions and can be easily matched to what people are looking for. You can go to Google Search Console and you can um, look up the queries people are actually using to get to your site. Um, you can use tools, but the tools uh, are not necessarily 100% reliable. Google Search Console is going to tell you. And there are certain tools like uh, one I like, Sitebulb, uh, you crawl and audit the site, if you connect it to your Google Search Console, it'll pull back every term used back however many days you say to go back. I think you can go back 16 months. So it'll pull that all in and it does branded search and non-brand mobile and desktop. And it's a really awesome tool and it costs like $50 a month. Uh, also a couple other tools here, I'm just gonna tell you about real quick. Entities or in links, if you are big into content, uh, it's a really good tool to go check out. They actually use Google's um, a semantic, well, entity API. Um, so they can tell you what entities are associated. They can analyze your content. They actually have the ability to make content briefs um, off those entity structures. And they actually have a script that you can go on your site and link pages internally uh, based on um, 
based on those entities. You get you decide what goes there. It doesn't do it without your permission. But it's a really great tool for if you want to start working in entities and um, natural language understanding as opposed to just keyword driven content. Um, schema markup and monitoring. This is just a way for you to check out schema and then uh, the schema check tool from Google. And so that's everything I've got for you today. So uh, and now I'm waiting for the instructions. I think I just <laughs> There we go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'll just speak for myself here, but after reading all these blogs on like, you should do this, you should do this, it's nice to know why I should do it. Because I feel like those blogs tell you what to do, but what you just went into is the why behind it. And it kind of helped me understand like, okay, that's why it's important. Like I get search engine lens telling me to do it from Oz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's nice to know the why behind it. So. Once again, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll ask some questions. I know Philip and I have some questions ourselves. We could talk about this for hours. <laughs> but um, chat, your questions are priority. So if you do have questions, feel free to put them in there. I will ask them or Philip will ask them. Um, but I think my first question to you is with Rank Brain. Obviously, you said don't prepare, don't like base your strategy around Rank Brain. But if like let's say you like sweets, right? You you came across this, you're like, oh, this is rank brain. Do you think, in your opinion, because I've heard mixed stuff on this, and I'm just curious to get your opinion, like you had different, like you had sweet sweat, you had sweets, shops, and stuff like that. Do you think that a click-through rate would be something that Google would help determine the direction of that keyword going forward? So let's say somebody searches sweets and a ton of people click on the sweet sweat. So do you think the future of that keyword could be determined by the click-through rate of basically users are telling Google, like, this is what people are clicking on? Or do you think click-through rate, like Google has told us in the past, really isn't a ranking factor? Well, yeah, it's definitely not a ranking factor. Like, that's definitely true. But um, just in normal search results, if I'm in the top 10 and nobody's clicking on me, Google will resort me. Um, it's just a sort order application, so I haven't been devalued or changed in my actual ranking value. But for that query, they'll decide maybe not the best match. You could try to, but the thing is that one, um, why? Because it's just going to change when you stop doing it. And um, two, it takes a long time. So when I first discovered Rank Brain, I followed it for a year before it picked up water rights in Mesquite, Nevada and changed that. And that wasn't me. Obviously, people that was during the California drought a few years back. And so people were probably looking up that information for that area. But um, and I also you'd have to, I mean, could you get a black hatter to make a script and use a bunch of IPs and, you know, um, that aren't yours and do it probably. Uh, but again, it would take a lot of clicks and a lot of effort, and a lot of time. You could probably just do better writing better content or you could write content that rank frame result and try to get them to better understand that you're the one that they should be looking for by adding schema and by doing doing the rank brain does that make sense yeah yeah i think that's a, a great explanation so marty had a question in the chat um and he said does google really need yoast or aio seo plugins i'm not really i'm not familiar with that so i'll let you <laughs> Uh, yeah, you do. Uh, one, because WordPress limits what you can actually change on WordPress and the free plugins. Um, WordPress has a deal where you have to provide a free plugin with so much functionality and then you can add functionality to charge. But the things that like Yoast and the other ones charge for um, goes beyond just what we're talking about today. Like if I move a page, the Yoast or the other SEO plugins will re do the redirect for me. I don't, know, I, have to, I don't have to know how to do the redirect. Um, I can just say redirect this to this and it does all the writing. Um, in addition, um, writing title tags and descriptions, um, writing a title that's not the same as the H1. There's all sorts of little things in there. So yeah, they're definitely worth their, their weight, so. Cool, good to know. It kind of helps people who are not as technologically as well understood as I am. Somebody who maybe doesn't get it like me to just use those plugins and let them do it for me. Exactly. That's what they're. That's what they're there for, right? If I have a small business client, they always go on WordPress 
because awesome. WordPress, I can put them on a managed host and they'll update all their plugins for them and they'll keep them secure. And if it all blows up, they'll fix it for them. So, <laughs> so yeah, WordPress is always the best. And they have the plugins to do all the things that coders would do, but they can't afford to pay coders to do. Makes sense. And then David asks if you, um, the question is, what is the best scheme of plugin for WordPress in your opinion? Uh, you know, no one's settled on one that's the best. Like everyone has different preferences. So I think I would just ask people in that whatever market he's in, which one they're using. I ask that question all the time and everyone's like, yeah, yes, ah, all in one, ah, rank math. Like there's like three or four main ones, but nobody has a definite clear, like this is the best one. Christine, let me um, ask you about keyword density, because I, again, try to boil all this down to, to practical advice. If I'm writing something 500 words, um, you know, in the past, years ago, right, there were formulas that would tell you, oh, you should use the keyword, you know, X times per hundred or something like that. And I think your presentation, really interesting, right, in terms of how Google's changed the way they kind of understand those keywords. but. Right, Google's advice is just write it naturally, mm -hmm. right? So, so don't think about us so much. You shouldn't be writing for Google. You should be writing kind of for your audience and trust us, we'll kind of figure it out. But I think one of the things you got into is these related words or going to Google image search and kind of seeing what, what terms are matched. Is Would your advice be, you know, do that, you know, sort of do think about those keywords and do try to kind of broaden um, the, the keywords that mean similar things or does it, you know, or stick to the kind of the, the one keyword that is the exact match for what you want, right? Like if you're you're trying to talk about chocolates, you don't want to say chocolate, 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 chocolate over and over again. So you could at one point say sweets, but you just showed us that Google's not exactly clear about, you know, what sweets means. They know what chocolates mean. So what's your advice on that perspective? So um, keyword density way back when was a thing. There's a bunch of SEOs who said it wasn't. No, it was because they were mathematical algorithms that had to be on the page enough for Google right. to pick it up. So me and my business partner, we actually found out like the sweet spot at the time, right? Uh, but that's years ago. And so they don't do keyword density anymore at all. Um, it doesn't mean your keyword shouldn't be on the page and it shouldn't be in the title and the description. By the way, descriptions used to be not, not for anything but getting people to click through their search result. Descriptions are used to pull featured snippets now. So it is important that descriptions are written and not just left, you know, for <laughs> a lot of times they're just empty. Because people are like, yeah, it doesn't matter, but it, it actually does. Um, but as far as you're, you're talking about, um, so you want to do the keyword research still because you still need to use the right terms. Um, if everyone's searching for, uh, when I was working over at Zappos, I think like they had a brand for water shoe, like something else it was called, but everyone typed in water shoe and now I think it was water shoe. And then now Google just knows it as a water shoe. If you type in the other stuff, it doesn't know. Yet everybody search for that. So you can look in Google Trends also. Another great way to look at what terms are being used is just use the drop down suggest. When you go to Google and it drops down the suggested words, because those are the most popular terms being used right now, or the evergreen ones that are always used. So it gives you a place to start. So you definitely want to have them in the page. You definitely want them in the title. The title is really important. And you definitely want them in the header, I mean, H1 in the first paragraph, you like your main key term. Uh, but after that, you can get a little bit more creative, right? You can say like um, chocolate, also known as, you know, what the other, you know, the scientific name for chocolate is, right? Those would definitely be related. Someone may be searching for uh, the scientific name as opposed to just the word chocolate. And so then that's in the page. But you would definitely use those as secondary um, and make sure that you use your primary term in those, in those spots. The spots still matter. You just don't want to do the keyword over and over again. And also be careful not to repeat it over and over again in your URLs just get spammy. Like I was working with a company where it's like, uh, you know, chocolate and then uh, chocolate bits and then it's a bundle of chocolate, right? So it was like, an, it wasn't chocolate, but it was another term, but it was in there like five times. So you don't need to do that either. <laughs> does that answer your question? It does, although you just raised another question, although I want to make it quick because I know we've got some other uh, questions from the audience. No, yeah, no, that that is something that we see our clients struggle with a bit and sometimes our writers struggle with Right. So, uh, yeah, if, if the main keyword is um, is chocolate ice cream. Right. You you're going to have you, you could have chocolate, like you said, sort of the, over and over again, chocolate by itself, chocolate ice cream as a combination of keywords. 
chocolate something, you know, so um, chocolate sprinkles. So you're, do you have to worry or will Google figure that out? Do you have to worry like, oh my God, I seem to be using chocolate like 85 times in here, but it was the right term to use because I'm not just talking about chocolate ice cream. I'm talking about chocolate. I'm talking about chocolate sprinkles. Um, what's your advice there? Well, if you're writing naturally, you wouldn't repeat chocolate, 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 right? Um, what you're saying if you're covered, yeah, you're, well, you're talking about chocolate ice cream and you want to mention that it has chocolate in it and that there's chocolate sprinkles. No, so I'm saying like it is kind of, let's say for whatever reason, it is natural for you to use chocolate over and over because it's a term used in multiple keywords, um, multi-word keywords. Um, do you then like have to worry about that or is that okay? Google gets it that chocolate ice cream is different than chocolate sprinkles. It kind of depends, right? It just, as we always say in search, it depends. Right. But it, it kind of depends on um, the context. So uh, it's also about good uh, formulation of the page structure, right? So if I'm like, this page is about chocolate, and I'm going to talk about chocolate sprinkles, and I don't need to also say in my content, chocolate sprinkles, blah, 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 chocolate sprinkles, right? So I can have it in the header, like this is about chocolate sprinkles, and this whole paragraph's about that. And Google gets the H2 is associated with the paragraph below, and so it associates the two together. So if you feel like you're over-optimizing on a term, it's really good to look at your page structure and see could you add some headers in. Maybe this should be two pages. Um, so well, I don't know if this is legend or real. I can never get a definite on it, but it's supposedly real. Um, when they were uh, going to look up how to do Google, they organized that information online. They went to the library to do research, and they're like, wait, this already exists. It's called a library. We don't, we don't have to reinvent this, right? So if you, I don't know if anyone listening remembers card catalogs, but card catalogs had a title and a description, your search result, and a Dewey Decimal number that told you about the book, right? Your URL. And then you go to the book, that's your website. Your table of contents is your navigation. And your chapters are your sections of your site and your page content. So if you're reading a book, you wouldn't want to be like, this is all about chocolate, and it's 100 pages about chocolate with no headers, no subsections, no, right? So whenever you're writing your content, you kind of want to think about it. You're writing a really good book. And if you're writing a page and the page gets muddied on the topic, add a page. And, and you should always have, if you have multiple pages in a category, a hub page that you can land on and Google can land on to get to all the content below it. So you can say, this is about chocolate, this section. It's a great section about chocolate, and we're going to talk about chocolate sprinkles, and we're going to talk about chocolate sundaes, and then when you get to the pages, it's singular, chocolate sundaes, chocolate sprinkles. And so that gives you more content to be ranked on, but also Google the idea that you have a depth and breadth of content about chocolate, yeah. which they like. It may, that's an authority. Like when people talk about this thing, eat, and they're like, authoritativeness not really a thing that Google has any ranking signals for. But if you have 100 pages on chocolate and your competitor has two pages on chocolate, well, guess who Google is going to think is probably the authority on chocolate, right? It's going to be the one with 100 pages, as long as people are linking to it and visiting it. Right, right. Thanks. OK. Um, that was a really good analogy. I like that. Kind of helped understand it a little bit better. Um, I think we have maybe one or two more questions real quick. Um, there's a question about your descriptions, and they said, is it better to do it in bullet point format? Descriptions? Like meditation? Yeah. yeah, I would assume, I I mean, the description is just the description, right? You can't really. Yeah, there's no, you can't put HTML code in the description, so. But perhaps that leads to a, a, another question about formatting is obviously, you want the user experience and the Google experience to, to be able to understand what you're talking about. So, I mean, bullet points, they, they obviously have a place, right, on, on page. Oh, yeah. For, yeah. I'm sorry. For As I say, if you notice a lot of news sites now have the bullet points and then the first paragraph is just everything in the bullet points. Right. Right. That's a technique to try to get pulled into featured snippets. This featured snippets only use paragraph, bullet points. Uh, there's two other tags. There's only four tags featured snippets. That's the one at the top, right? They use. So um, news organizations like to put that information in a bullet point because it can get pulled into other things in Google search. So bullet points are great, and Google loves bullet points as long as they're used appropriately. You want everything to be a list. But. Great. Um, I think, oh, one other question. You said, what are some other unique categories like recipes? Um, there's a whole, if you look up, okay, anytime you're looking for something Google wrote, you have to put Google developer docs because Google stuff doesn't rank. I don't know why. 
<laughs> so if you put schema gallery, Google developer docs, it will give you every type of schema that you can use, how it's implemented, um, any problems, you know, like things you have to be careful of um, when you implement. Um, also, one real quick note to anyone who's new to schema, what's in your schema has to match your page. Don't change them. It's called cloaking. You will get a manual action for it from Google and they'll go, no, you're bad. And then you have to fix it. They come back really quick but you don't want to have that happen to you. So make sure if you put it in the schema, it's the same as on the page. And Cody, before you continue, I guess um, uh, I'm going to give a huge plug for Christine's uh, Twitter, uh, right? So I think if you want to stay up to date on everything that's happening with Google, you should go to Twitter. Uh, Christine, I know you had it on your um, PowerPoint, did. but Cassandra, maybe you can, uh, you can add it to the chat. It's at S-C-H-A-C-H. I N. So we'll we'll put it there. It is. We've, we've ah, I did it already. <laughs> it Short. But yeah. Short. So uh, I totally recommend that you follow Christine on Twitter. I'm sure if people reach out to you on Twitter, Christine, you'll get back to them if they have questions that we couldn't get to. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so. Much.